Around one in ten of us have to live with the symptoms of tinnitus. This is where you can hear a persistent noise ringing in your ears or your head, and there's nothing external to cause it. This is a simulation of what some different cases of tinnitus might sound like. Those simulations were provided by the British Tinnitus Association, but everyone's is different. The severity can range from irritating to completely life-changing. It can make it nearly impossible to work or sleep, and there is currently no cure. But now scientists have come up with a way to reduce the severity of the symptoms by stimulating parts of the brain responsible for causing these phantom sounds. Here's Susan Short from the University of Michigan who led the work. Well, we've been using animal models and studying the basic science of tinnitus for over a decade now. And what we do is we use guinea pigs because their ears and their parts of their brain are very similar to the human. But with guinea pigs, we are able to put electrodes into the brain and record from the very neurons that are generating the sound that is the phantom sound. We have found that after we give the guinea pigs a loud noise exposure, one that we know will induce tinnitus, we measure from their brains in the first place in the brain that gets input from the ear, which is called the cochlear nucleus. What we measure in those neurons is a an, an hyper excitability. In other words, the neurons are firing much faster than they usually would, and they're firing at about the same rate that they would fire if there was an actual sound there but there is not a sound there. So they're creating the sound by the, the firing when there isn't a sound there. And in addition to that, they synchronize with each other in the same way that neurons would synchronize with each other in the presence of a real sound. I see. So this sound is literally being created in the brain by these neurons firing when they shouldn't be. Exactly. What we've learned in my lab over the past 10 years or so is that these neurons don't only respond to sound stimulation, but they respond to touch stimulation. So if we stimulate the face of the neck region, we can also make these neurons fire. And the interesting thing about this is that these two different senses make the neurons fire as they should for coding sounds. But when we induce damage in the cochlea, the inputs from the cochlea are reduced, but the inputs from the touch system are increased. And they sort of go haywire, and they contribute to the neurons becoming hyperactive. So that's why many people who have tinnitus are able to modulate their tinnitus by clenching their jaw or pushing on their neck, because they're stimulating this particular connection between the two senses. Okay, and so now you know what is setting off these neurons. Have you any ideas of a way to calm them down, I suppose? Yeah, well, that's what we figured out in the study is that we figured out from doing the studies with the guinea pigs is that if we combined the two sensory stimulation by putting an electrical stimulation pad on the animal's face or neck and then combining that with sound stimulation in a very specific order and interval, for some orders and intervals, we made the firing rate go up. But for other intervals and orders, we made the firing rate go down. And so we figured out which were the best intervals to make the firing rate go down to calm down the cells. And then we took that sound combination, the sound plus the electrical stimulation, and we played that to the guinea pigs for 20 minutes a day for a month. And we showed that we could reduce the firing rate long term in those neurons. And consequently, we also reduced behavioral evidence of tinnitus in the animals. So that's in guinea pigs. Have you tested it in humans? Well, that's what the second study um, did, actually, that's reported in this paper. We took the same stimulus that reduced the tinnitus in the guinea pigs, and we played it to humans in the same configuration. We put an electrode on their cheek or on their neck, and we put a sound in their ear at the same interval and order that had reduced the tinnitus in the guinea pigs. And then we did a double-blinded study with 20 human patients, and we found that the, um, on average, when we looked at the whole group, we got a significant reduction in their tinnitus loudness and also in their reaction to their tinnitus. Okay, so how, how long did this reduction last and how strong was it? Because I suppose 20, 20 people is not a huge sample size. Right, it is a small sample size, but nonetheless, we were able to get statistically significant differences. 
So for some people, this decrease was amounting to a clinically significant decrease in their loudness and and in their TFI scores, which is the the questionnaire that we use to assess their life impact. So we're very uh, encouraged by this initial result. And yeah, how would this work in practice? Is it something people would have to go into clinics for? Well, at the moment, it's not available for commercialization. But for right now, we're planning on a second clinical trial that will start in the fall. And for the clinical trial, the patients get to take home the device. So they're first trained how to use it. Their tinnitus is assessed, and the device is set up with their own specialized signal. And then they take this home, and they use it for 30 minutes a day and come back into the clinic once a week for testing. Ultimately, this would be a take-home device that patients are trained to use by an audiologist or a health professional, and then they would take it home um, and use it at home for a certain amount of time a day that we determine in the next trial is to be most effective. That was Susan Shaw of the University of Michigan, and that work was published in the journal Science Translational Medicine.